So Bill Nirenberg, Fred Seitz, and Bob Jasher, who were the original merchants of doubt, had all were either deceased or um, ill by the time we were writing our book, which is also one reason we didn't interview them. I mean, th they get very stressed, and like the Marshall Institute will say, "Oh, but Oreskes never even interviewed them." And like, well, two of them were dead, so it'll be a little hard to interview them. And one of them was already senile. Well, so for Fred Seitz and his colleagues, it's not just about tobacco. It's about a broader ideological belief in free market economics and a belief that protecting the free market protects your political and personal freedoms as well. And this is very, very much tied up with the Cold War. So Fred Seitz, Fred Singer, Bill Nuremberg, Bob Jastrow, the four key players in our book, were all physicists. And they were all physicists who came of age in the Cold War and who had worked on American weapons and rocketry programs and who had risen to quite high levels of power and influence within American science and American science advising through their work on these rocketry and weapons programs. And I think it's fair to say that all of them honestly believed uh, that the Soviet Union was a serious threat. They honestly believed that communism was a threat to the world, that the communist menace, the communist threat, the threat of communist expansion was real. And that science and technology had played a crucial role in the Cold War in protecting the West from Soviet and communist expansionism. And I think they believed all of that authentically. To me, the kind of mistake, the sort of logical mistake they make is that when the Cold War ends, instead of being happy and popping some champagne corks, they look for a new enemy. And that new enemy is what they see as a kind of reds under the bed, which is environmentalists. They think that environmentalism is going to become a slippery slope to socialism because they fear that environmental issues will be used as a justification for government regulation, government encroachment in the marketplace, and ultimately the government taking control of our lives. So in a couple of places they say this explicitly. There's one particularly explicit discussion in the 1990s about secondhand smoke. The US EPA is moving to regulate secondhand smoke because it's been demonstrated scientifically that secondhand smoke can kill you, and it can kill your husband and your wife and your children and lead to sudden infant death syndrome. I mean, a lot of seriously bad things. But the merchants of Dow work with the tobacco industry and they say, well, once the government starts to regulate dangers like secondhand smoke, there's no limit to what the government can do. So it's a slippery slope argument. And like all slippery slope arguments, you know, there's a kernel of truth in it. I think most of us would agree that we don't want the government interfering in our personal lives, you know, to the, as much as possible. We'd like to be the masters of our own destiny. But at the same time, we also recognize that if a company is selling products that are killing people and lying about it, that's a problem, right? And so somewhere between those two extremes, you know, there's an appropriate level of government involvement. So in a way, this becomes a question about the appropriate role of government. And that, to me, you know, I feel like when we were doing this research, when I realized that, I thought, well, why can't we just have that conversation, right? That's a legitimate question. I'd be happy to sit down with, well, Fred Seitz, may he rest in peace, isn't with us any longer, but if he were, you know, I'd be happy to talk, sit down any day with any intelligent person and talk about, well, how do we sort that out? But that's not what they did. Instead of saying that this is a question about the appropriate role of government, they demonized environmentalists, and they began this campaign of trying to undermine the scientific data in order to prevent government regulation. And I think in their own minds, they persuaded themselves that what they were doing was right. And that's, this story is so filled with ironies from beginning to end. But to me, one of the saddest ironies is that I can remember as a child being taught that what was wrong with communism was not that they were trying to build a better world uh, or that it was an unrealistic sort of utopian dream, but that they had the ideology that the ends justified the means and so that the Bolsheviks had done a lot of terrible things in the name of defending the proletariat, right? But the irony to me is that so these merchants of doubt, that's what they do. They begin to do all kinds of really inappropriate things, dishonest things, but they justify it in their own minds because they think they're protecting democracy.